So on June 27th, uh, my friend Hillary posted a picture of a badge that she was awarded by her Fitbit. And the icon was a graphic image of two gorillas. It had kind of hills and mountains in the background and leaves and bushes in the foreground. And the type read, um, staggering, you've earned the Africa badge. It's a jungle out there, but that's not stopping you. Because at 5,000 lifetime miles, you've walked the entire length of Africa. If that's not a reason to go bananas, we don't know what is. Now, this particular friend of mine is one who, and I don't think she'd mind me saying this, is kind of like, I know a lot of people like this who grew up um, around white people, especially first generation, and their lives have forced them to be introduced to their blackness in kind of a brand new way. And so she is for real, for real about blackness right now in her life. Anyway, as you can imagine, she wasn't pleased to get this badge. She initially reached out to Fitbit and she filed a complaint. The complaint included the line, (laughs) there are literally hundreds of other animals you can choose from. They respond, thanks for taking the time to let us know about your concerns in regards to the badges. Please know there is no intent to offend anyone through the lighthearted descriptions and that your comments is not going unnoticed. Please let us know if there's anything else we may do to assist you in the meantime. Okay, so my friend, who's an academic, was seriously pissed off at this point. She follows up with some supporting documentation, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to say that the line, the very complex and disgusting history of comparing Black people to primates, was included in that correspondence. And she even gave them some uh, material to read just in case they couldn't trust her. She also gave them some other um, suggestions, zebra, lion, gazelle. After a little bit of back and forth, and that was mostly Fitbit sending canned messages, um, they started to get a little snippy. Um, Here's one message. Hi, as I mentioned before, all points of view are welcome. We truly appreciate you for sharing your thoughts and feedback. And then cut and pasted a link to the Fitbit community um, and said that she could post some information there. So at this point, Hillary is putting her troops together and people are coming in full force. People are pissed off about it, which you can understand. They, she, they, she and her friends start tweeting. Um, I retweeted a couple, but I don't have any followers, so nobody knew. Um, and this stuff flies back. And so her tweet, which begins, this is problematic at best, um, is great. And evidently lots of people catch on and start talking to Fitbit. So Fitbit responds, please know there is no intent to offend anyone through the lighthearted descriptions that your comment and that your comment is not going unnoticed. And then a super condescending. Thanks for the feedback. After reviewing the badge and speaking with our team, we want to provide you with some insight. Gorillas live exclusively in the tropical rainforest of Africa, and we feel it's a strong symbol of the beauty and strength of Africa. At long last, uh, the law being paid back, they finally come back with, and this is on the 7th of July, update. We've decided to make a change. We'll be updating the badge with a new design and congratulatory messaging. And there was more about needing to test out the message, and they weren't sure when it was going to roll out. But there was kind of a, a desperate assurance that this badge would be changed. So that's great, Fitbit. Fitbit, I mean, good on you. and. I'm glad you were able to listen. But my question is, why does it take so much conversation to actually bring something to a company's attention? And why is it that you have a staff that includes not a single person who would have looked at that badge and thought, this is, as my friend might say, problematic. And I I just don't understand why people of color have to work so hard to convince white people that something is offensive. And why do white people think that they're still the final arbiters of what is offensive? And so also, why in the middle before you decided to change it, did you get snippy with people like, why are you bothering with us with this? All these white people have seen this badge and no one thought was offended by it before. And now you're making a big deal about it as if there's something wrong with saying you are indeed problematic. And I would just offer there's no like 2200 mile trail of tears badge because you understand that that's not great marketing because you've been conditioned to know that there should be some shame around around the story of the Trail of Tears, even if you don't exactly understand what the shame should be. And I think I just it's kind of like when Bomani Jones wore that 
Cleveland Caucasian shirt. Remember, they lost their whole minds. But these are people who don't think Cleveland Indians is a problem. Why do you not get that if I'm giving you exactly what you gave me and you're offended, this is possibly offensive? I It makes me crazy. And I think no matter how many books, movies, lectures that people read or see or hear, the underlying issue is that Whiteness convinces people that they are entitled to protection and privilege and acting with impunity. And I think there also is the understanding that minorities are supposed to acknowledge and preserve their right to do those things. And I call that ridiculous. That's my version of this week in fuck. Thank you for tuning in to Tackling Tom Foolery. I'm Malika Rogers. I'm Franzi Moore. And I'm A.M. Lewis. Hey, everybody. We are glad to be here this week. I am actually feeling lightweight, decent. My ankle is feeling a tad bit better. How y'all doing today? As the little bank teller said to me some time ago, I'm Gucci. Okay. <laughs> That's what the bank teller said. Told me it was Gucci. Totally. Not what told me said. I was Gucci. Yeah. It's exactly it's what, you, what say. you say at your bank job. That's right. When you're transacting the money. Is that that is that. right. Just mm-hmm. out here counting these Benjamins, bitch. That's how, <laughs> that's how I like yeah. the bank teller to talk to that. me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's how many right, honeys you want? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want all big faces? <laughs> that's how I like it at the bank. <laughs> Yeah. God forbid they should just be quiet and polite. Yeah. <laughs> Usually, well, let's not. Yes, I, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Let me not be labor a point. Gucci. That's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Why are you still Gucci. seeing a bank teller? No, that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> listen. It's, listen. Not a, it's none of my business. I'm sorry. I get a teller. <laughs> no, okay. I get a check. <laughs> I get a check from my side gig, okay? But can't and you just take a picture of it on your app? Sometimes I want my monies. Okay, okay. Franzi. Listen, I tried I to back monies. away from it. Listen, I, people do what they do for you reasons that they do it. it. Once I tried you walk to back in, away. you can't back out. Okay. You walk in, can't back out. That's You'll what he turn said. Around and walk out. That's right. <laughs> no unringing so. of the bell. No, no. But yes, yeah, sometimes I do take the picture and deposit it with the app, which is lovely. And then sometimes, bitch, better have my money. Okay, pay me what you owe me. Yeah, my right. mom says so and so draws shit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. I, wish I, I could draw one and take it I, in. I, draws I a do check. not know why she says that. Like she's old and from Oklahoma or something. I'm like, <laughs> you're from L.A. Like, why do you talk like this? I don't understand. Well, mm. you know, she draws a check from such and such. And sometimes she says, <laughs> and sometimes she says he gets a check or she gets a check instead of so and so's retired. It's well, you know, he gets a check. I don't. We all get a check, pretty much. But whatever. No, Bless my parents heart. say that too. They See, say the I'm, exact same thing. You know, he gets a check from the military <laughs> retired. <laughs> you like, such and such. You know, they get a check. He gets a check from the state. <laughs> Yeah. I do not understand. It's ne- no one's ever retired. No. Or whatever. They just or get a on check. disability or whatever. Mm-hmm. They just be out there getting a check. Mm-hmm. Or they you know, draw just, a I check. Think, and sometimes it's not just a check. It's a good check. You oh, know, yeah. Such such a, they get a good check from the state. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He making that when, good money. When they mm-hmm. left, they was high up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I heard he, oh my gosh. I, I heard he drew down all his money before he left there. <laughs> Whoa, boy. I feel like in we about 20 years. We could do a whole show about old black colloquialisms. We really could. Well, that they're would be, my favorite. That would be hilarious. Especially yeah. the fact that I'm guilty of saying them. Me too. I had to explain make groceries to someone today. I was just about to say make groceries. Mm-hmm. That's tragic. Mm-hmm. I that did. is tragic. I had to, um, I had a person at work. I said I had on my house shoes and 
He said, oh, do you mean slippers? No, bitch. I mean house shoes. <laughs> it goes like, with the house coat, not okay. the robe. Because the, the house, house coat, coat ain't even got no buttons or a zipper. You just hold okay. that shit together and mm-hmm. you wear it with your house shoes. Don't yeah. question me. Do you mean slippers? No, I meant what the no. hell I said, Heffa. I, I said, said what I said. Shoes. Hello. <laughs> Hashtag <laughs> Mimi. <laughs> the only thing of hers I'll ever quote. It's the best thing ever. Me too. That's it. And yeah, she has nothing else of value. To now, say. I don't want to discount it because Nini's had some prize moments. But if you, <sighs> I, I'm just saying you are missing out on some uh, Nini isms, but neither here nor there. I said what I said will be what I take to my grave. I like it. <laughs> because, because, <laughs> I mean, you can say the worst my nonsense ever and stand by that shit with I said what I said. True yeah. enough. You could say something that is a a whole lie. <laughs> proven, a proven falsity. I said what I said. Okay. And that makes it true. So, yep. Ramsey, how are you doing today? Ah, I might. Oh, oh. <laughs> we, might, we might be getting ready to hear a little more about that. So we're going to get into our highs and lows. And so... Franzi, I know you have a low, which might be lightly related to why you're just all right today. Mm. So let's just start off with you. Well, in the spirit of full disclosure, and I know that the two of you know this, um, you know, my, as the old folks say, um, monthly business is, (laughs) uh, Mm. let's just Let's just say it's an ordeal. And if you've ever heard me refer to Carrie on the show, that's what I'm talking about. I don't care if it's TMI, it's what we're doing. So <laughs> life is upon me, right? And I, you know, the thing that makes me the most mad every time, it's like when I was having to pay for my car, it's like, I don't even like you. Why am I sending payments to pay for you? I'm definitely mm. never using this uterus. Like I genuinely feel like God could just put it in hot, but that's neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. So yesterday, Uh, My friend needed a ride home. Her something was happening with her car was smoking even after she got out, whatever, whatever. She sent me a text. I said I would take her. But now where I had to, she lives in the all the way boonies. So Mm. it would be the equivalent, you guys, of if she worked downtown and I live downtown, I would have to take her to Folsom to take her home. Nope. So she lives in the upside down. Oh, boy. So I said yes, and I took her, and um, I went to pick her up. You know, the trip is, you know, lengthy. The trip was lengthy. We got there. She just, she said she wanted to go to Kroger, so we get out to go to Kroger. I've been driving for a while, so my feet are swollen. My back hurts. Mm-hmm. My torso hurts. My And I get really bad, like, um, pain through my hamstrings. Like, all of that is wrong. So I am walking into this store with her and I feel a little bit lightheaded. So I picked up a juice and we head back to the seafood counter, which is where she was going. And there's a little boy there. He's an adorable little boy. He'd seen her before. He's like, oh, hey, you're back to her. Mind you, this is my friend who is, I would say we are of an age. She is four years younger than I am. We're standing there and he is smiling, this big old smile. And he says to her, Oh, so you brought your mom today. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. So I would like to think that I'm not a very vain person. And I feel like the two of you guys can really be like, I'm probably the only person that you know who, if you are rolling to breakfast, like I can be out of the house in five minutes. Don't ask me what I look like, but I'm really, I like, that's who I am. So it's not so much that I'm so vain and how, first off, I don't think I look that old. Secondly, This woman is like a whole ass grown person. Like she looks like a grown woman. There's nothing like, you know, she, she, whatever. So I had an attitude and I was like, is, am I entering a phase? Am I getting ready to be in my mom phase? Like for the rest of my life, I'm going to be people's moms, like my friends' moms. And it put me in a place that was so low. And I can only attribute it to all the other things happening in life. But it was like, I barely walked back here. So I said out loud an expletive and I told my friend, I'm going to go to the front of the store and wait for you while I think about this and the rest of my whole life. So I'm currently in the process of reconsidering my whole life because 
This grown woman, I cannot. I like. It was a moment. That's all I'll say. It was, it was a moment. <laughs> and I truly do think it was the low of my week because for real, I'm your mom. Okay. Okay. I Am I had that happen to me uh, on more than one occasion. <sighs> with someone uh, who is younger than I am, but certainly not young enough to be uh, any child of mine. And twice uh, men have said that once an, a man older than I oh. am and once a man younger and probably closer to her age. And both men were trying to talk to her. Okay. So I don't know if they felt like, well, let me insult this old bitch and that'll make her <laughs> like me. I don't, I don't know what they were thinking, but um, I, 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 I feel your pain. I, I understand. I have been there. I think, um, and the shit was insulting and hurtful. And even though they were just two bootsy ass dudes anyway, it still made me mad and hurt my feelings a little bit. It was a bit of an ego bruise. And even though I know I don't look old enough to be that woman's mother, I still felt offended. And maybe, you know, I'm looking in the mirror like, wait, did I miss something? But I didn't. They were just stupid. But it still didn't make it any less insulting. Listen, listen. You know, I have all the mama stories. (laughs) I can go way. I can go back. I was a teenager dating this dude. I was 17. He was 19. Um, this is probably the first time. And we were at his house and his mom came home and he introduced me to his mom and, you know, then took me home. And later on, he said that his mom was like, who was that old woman? Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm mom. 17. He's he's 19, 17. Then people used to think my brother was my son. I've been accused one time recently. Sharon and I were shopping for New Year's Eve for her in Macy's and Citrus Heights. And the woman who was uh, at the register thought I was Sharon's mother. Sharon. Sharon is Alicia's friend who, aren't you two the same age? Sharon is a year younger. No, she's a year younger than me. So you two are basically the same Uh, age. Yes, yes. And... The grand prize chosen specially just for me. I was shopping with my husband one time and the chick in JC Penney's thought I was his mama and I was pregnant. No, no. Dead serious. So please understand that when you told that story earlier, I really, really knew because like Malika said, it is hurtful and I don't Mm -hmm. care how you look in the mirror. I don't care how much you look in the mirror trying to see what they see. Mm-hmm. knowing that it's really not there right um you cannot like you said the bell can't be unrung yeah it can't no it, it just it can't and not to mention you guys saw my story on facebook about me wearing yes. the doggone nina simone <laughs> earrings and the chick who was from a little bit of a distance i have to admit and maybe just saw a small figure on the earrings and somehow you anyway, ain't for the people, I have these earrings that have Nina Simone on them. She's standing in a crouch. She has on black pants and a turtleneck and a little, um, and a little afro. And I was in C's Candy and the, the C's Candy woman saw my earrings like, I love your earrings. Is, is that your grandchild? Oh my God. <laughs> what in the whole entire fuck lady? <laughs> Especially since Nina Simone has looked looked like a grandmother when she was seven. I mean, like, <laughs> come yeah. on. Nina's- and I know you have had to be very close to see her face on the earrings, but I'm just saying. But my grandchild? Why my your grandchild? grandchild? Why grandchild? Come on, lady. <laughs> come on. I'd have been like my son's seven just because. I know, right? I would have told you. I know. That. I have a seven year old son, and I don't have any uh, children, but still. You know. But why even volunteer this line of conversation? Why not just say, I love your earrings. Who is that? So that you don't have any chance of being. Eric and I had not exchanged any words. I was just standing there wishing that I could die. And so maybe it was just the pain on my face that he interpreted as mama pain. I don't know. But you didn't even have to say that. You could have just said, hello. Um, Are you looking for crab too? Like that would have been plenty sufficient. Don't be assuming. Don't, Don't be make assuming. assumptions. And the All asses right. of you and me Man. become a real thing. Man. 
So now I'm just gonna wear booty shorts everywhere I go. So people, <laughs> no, people will just be like, that ain't gonna stop nothing. <laughs> no, nope. they'll be like, what's somebody's mama doing out here with her ass out in the shorts? That's exactly what is gonna happen. That's a That's shame. Exactly you know she right. is too old. Mm, mm, mm. Now that oh. woman got all her clothes on and her mama out there with her booty hanging out. <laughs> okay. It won't okay. it won't change anything. It you cannot won't. win, break even, or get out of the game. No. Get out of the game. No. Man, no. I can't win, child. Uh, on, on the upswing, though, yeah. my high is this. And I'm just going to preface with you know, both of you know that I have a weakness for anything that is like blackity, make black, black. Even when it's crazy, <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Like the old folk sayings that we were just talking about. Like, mm-hmm. I just love it. Um, witness my ability to get through Luke Cage. Um, after Mahershala Ali left, but neither here, <laughs> neither here nor there. I just love it. So the today I was on Instagram and I I follow Marcus Samuelson really just because I'm nosy and he makes good looking food because I'm not crazy about him. You know, Tom mm. Colicchio and Eric Repair are sort of my celebrity chef crushes. Mm, but mm. his baby Zion just turned. I said like old people Zion. Zion just turned one and these pictures were so darling. Like he is so cute. The little girl is so cute. And I was looking at him and his brown wife and I was like, now how is this Ethiopian man who grew up (laughs) in this Nordic or where did he grow up? Sweden married to this other beautiful brown I, whatever mm. it just made my whole heart happy and that led into like a tunnel where i was just sort of like a wormhole where then i was looking at daniel day kim and his cute little kids and i was just like mm. look at these cute little families and i was just thinking mm. you know i don't have a family i don't really want a family but cute families are just so cute and i feel sad for these children who are going to grow up with all that we're leaving behind, but it just put me in a really good place. And that was my high, particular since clearly I'm in mama mode these days. So, um, you know, (laughs) that was my high. Mm, I like it. AM was your low. Oh, shoot. That was my shout out. Dang it. That's all right. You'll just switch them up at the end. I'm sorry. Okay. You all right? Yeah, I've recovered. And I should have just been looking at my notes. I'm okay. (laughs) <laughs> she said forlornly mm. um, <laughs> let's see let me refer to my notes do, 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 do. okay my low for this week is probably going to be obvious there are two of them that are very obvious mm-hmm. the first one is R. Kelly of course which is and thank you <laughs> it's R. Kelly but you know that gets expected um, to a degree from someone who as I recall, in 2003, in an interview with Ed Gordon, asked Ed Gordon to define teenager when Ed <laughs> Gordon asked him if he was attracted, sexually attracted to teenagers. So that bit with Toure that everybody is referring to, old news for a girl. Right. I remember the first interview he said that. Um, but not just what he is um, accused of doing, but also, once and again, the caping for him by various and sundry people, which is just always a huge bummer to me, to put it lightly. So that's one low. But my other expected low is the cop shooting in Minneapolis where the cop mm-hmm. was a uh, Somalian and he shot a, a woman originally from Australia. Um, and the furor that I've been seeing over that and the difference in the way it's being covered, the way people are talking about it. And, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm trying to brace myself for what I am pretty sure is going to be a very different set of circumstances mm-hmm. with regard to investigating, with regard to charges, and likely with regard to sentencing, not only because he's black, but because he's a Somalian Muslim. Mm-hmm. I know the if I I'm pretty sure the Minneapolis St. Paul area has a huge Somali community and there have been some concerns, you know, from the people about the Somalis coming in there and Sharia law and infiltrating and not assimilating and whatnot. Um I just feel, you know, I feel a way about it. It it's been it's been a little rough to see 
the posts online and the ways that people are talking about it. So those are my expected twin lows. Um, my high this week was the defiant ones. Um, I had no idea this was coming on because, you know, I don't have the TVs and I don't pay attention. To, I don't pay attention to entertainment media like I used to. I don't read entertainment weekly like I used to, which used to be my for real plug on whatever was coming. Movies, TV, cable, all of that. So I heard someone talking about it or saw someone talking about it in passing. Still didn't think about it. Was laying on my bed trying to figure out what I wanted to watch. Thought I'd see what was up with HBO. Stumbled across it. And it was really, really interesting. I love a good documentary. I'm a huge fan of good docs. Um, I thought it was well done. Like every time somebody I knew popped up on the screen and then they would put that, you know, back in the day um, footage of Jimmy Iovine in the studio with mm-hmm. them and blah, blah, blah. Um, I just really enjoyed it as 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 someone who, you know, enjoys music, basically, um, and likes to know the background to things to a degree. It was cool. It was really cool. Even the NWA stuff, because as anyone who knows me knows, <laughs> I'm not super well versed in hip hop. Who doesn't know NWA and know the basics of that story? But that part was cool, too. Even hearing Dre talk about it and hearing him talk about his past and at this late stage, apologizing for some of his fuckery. Um, I enjoyed it very much. And if anybody is listening and hasn't watched it and has access to HBO and enjoys music or just likes good documentaries, it's a series of three. I highly recommend it. No, four. Four. Yeah. Is it four? four? Oh, we're seeing three. What's happening? Is there another one coming? What? No, no, they're all, they're all out. They're all out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will but, turn on my TV right now on mute and see what's up. Why I missed the fourth one. Yeah, yeah I agree that they were really, really good and well done. I was surprised to see D Barnes on there, which let me know that because I was kind of like, oh, another shiny piece for Dre, you know, because the NWA mm-hmm. movie was definitely PR for him and Ice Cube, I thought. Um, and I, I'm not saying that they delved deeply but they had her on and they i didn't know that she was their homegirl i never knew that like i knew d barnes from pump it up but i didn't know that they were close friends which to me made the act more egregious did we talk about this last week but anyway Mm -hmm. um i i agree with you it was awesome i mean it was really good and i think um it was really interesting to me to see how their foolishness affected so many other branches of business i hadn't even Mm. considered that yeah yeah it was really good very well done very um entertaining and informational to me two of my favorite things yeah it is a great it's a great yeah. what uh, you got Malika well Milo is also not necessarily R. Kelly himself he's already gross I've talked about how gross he is already um, in life, I've been saying it for years, but mostly, um, I'm bothered by the mentality of a lot of the people I have heard and read, um, with regarding their response mm. to the latest allegations regarding him, and I hate the naming of any random piece of shit white person brought up to match against him. What about Woody Allen? I what about Woody Allen? Mm. Right now, we talking about Robert. We're not talking about Woody right now. I we're not talking about that, you know, mm. or what about Hugh Hefner? We're Daniel not talking Polanski. about Hugh Hefner. And I that bothers me it it bothers me the idea of one on on the at the base of it thinking we have to use white behaviors and actions as our measuring stick for how we should act or not act that in itself is stupid and then also trying to deflect from the issue like somebody is going to go into court they they've been charged with a rape and what's the defense going to be Well, so-and-so raped people, too. You cannot use that as a defense. Like, the issue is there is probably a problem going on in his home, and that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about Woody 
and his nasty ass. We're not talking about Roman Polanski and his nasty ass. Yes, they're all disgusting, but we're not talking about them. I don't like um, the way all of the people trying to defend him are just in the Mm. process shitting on his victim. That bothers me the most. A lot of things bother me about how people are responding, but that bothers me the most. That in the process of, no, he didn't, or I don't believe it because I like his songs, or Step in the Name of Love is so awesome. How could he possibly? Um, uh, outside, every time people say that, basically what they're telling women and girls, he's manipulated, mm-hmm. raped, whatever, is that they ain't shit. Their lives don't mean shit. What has happened to them doesn't mean shit. They're not ever going to be worth anything. Um, so that that probably bothers me the most about the whole thing and, and as far as the way people are responding to it. So anyway, he's still gross and stupid and whack and whatever, but the people mm-hmm. defending him to me are right up there with him. Right, right on the same level. So uh, my high was uh, I had a really epic weekend. Hmm. Friday night, I went to see J. Cole, which was like the best thing I've done in a while. Um, the show was amazing. The crowd was crazy. Um, I went with my brother, so that was fun. I think that's the first concert we've ever gone to together. Um, so it was dope. Um, and it was a perfect evening aside from the fact the young girl, well, a 28 year old woman was sitting behind me and she was chatting me up a little bit and um, asked me who my favorite rapper is. And I told her, I don't just have one. I said, maybe I could give her a top five. I start naming people. And then I say Fife from a tribe called Whoa. Quest, and that broad said who was a tribe <laughs> oh, called God. Quest. Oh my so God. There, there was, I couldn't even, <laughs> I didn't want to talk to her anymore after that. I just wanted to turn around and end it. But she was so super friendly and polite. I couldn't be rude, but I, I, I wanted to call her name. Um, Malika, you should have hit her with that ice cube line. Oh, I thought you were one of the smart ones, but you're not. <laughs> Run along. <laughs> Higher learning. Yes, indeed. I was so <laughs> done with her. I, I said, wait, how old are you? Because I thought maybe she was going to tell mm-hmm. me she was 20 or something. And then I wouldn't have been mad. Um, but she said 28. And then I thought, well, there's no excuse by 28. So anyway, it was still an awesome night. And then the next day, I flew down to Southern California, spent some time with my boyfriend's family, met a bunch of his people. So that was cool um, to meet his family, cool to get away. It was a good little road trip, flew down, drove back. It was nice. So I had a good time. Um, I'm not going to say that J. Cole was the highlight of the week. (laughs) That. <laughs> but he was the highlight of the weekend okay anyway mm-hmm. um, <laughs> I was just so excited to see him I'm such Thank a you. fan and so anyway awesome concert so hey fellow tacklers We thank you so much for listening to our show. If you're interested in supporting us, we would be ever so grateful. You can donate to the Tackling Tomfoolery podcast at patreon.com backslash Tackling Tomfoolery. Today, uh, what we're talking about is activating activism. You know, there's a lot of um, talk that surrounds people who are sort of considered social justice warriors and the difference between how social justice is approached um, today as opposed to how it may have been addressed a few decades ago and a lot of talk of people, um, people's um, forms of activism being null or, you know, not or, or being mildly helpful instead of making any major change because so much of what is done now is done online 
you know, people are putting things on Twitter or Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, whatever they might think. And um, a lot of people who are more traditional um, feel like that's not working or doesn't work or it's doing nothing or people are just talking and not doing anything. Or, you know, even the people who protest maybe go out on the streets and they carry signs. There are people who say, that's not doing anything. You're not changing anything. You're just standing there with a sign. So we're going to talk a little bit about, I guess, what we think activism is, what it is for us, um, and whether or not we feel like what we see people doing and what we do ourselves really working is it exacting the change we'd like to see on any kind of level. Um, so I guess I'm going to start with asking, you know, how do you all define activism like Francie what is it for you um can I first tell you that when I was talking to Candace I was kind of talking through my position on it and she and I said yeah and so you have to ask yourself and then she interrupted to say are you doing as much as you can for the struggle <laughs> and then proceeded to go on with like several stanzas from uh revolution from arrested development and I thought I love that girl. So um, <laughs> I, I, I so I'm really curious to know what you guys think. And I think instead of exactly answering your question, I'm going to sort of talk about my focus. I will say that I think there are lots of ways that you can be that you can be an activist. But I do think doing something is a crucial piece of that. And I don't think perusing social media or fighting with random people on social media is doing something. So um, I, I'm really interested to hear what is going to come later, but I, I do want to say that I feel like um, right now, my particular focus is like um, about me and my people. And I don't know if you guys read that son of Baldwin post, let them fucking die. Did you read that? Um, yes. It, so I have had really mixed feelings about it and I won't bother. We'll link to it. Of course, I won't bother to read it all, but it really is just saying specifically about bigots. It's talking about, but it goes right. on like it closes out with, and it talks about how we try to, and I feel like a lot of our activism is work with helping white people get over themselves. And I feel like that for me is a no go. Like I'm not interested in that kind of, movement i'm not even really interested in a like move like working to move towards a place where we can all sit down and have a conversation because i feel like at this point if you don't know you don't want to know right and so this piece of by son of baldwin sort of says if you see them choking if you see them dying and it's a response to the steve scalise thing you know everybody's making a big deal that what's mm -hmm. her name Brittany griner griner i think is her name um rescued him and um, he was doing her job and no, no fault to her, right. but just saying you are not helping yourself when you help bigots survive. And I think I shy away from co-signing completely, mostly because you can't tell if somebody's choking, whether or not they're a bigot. But I do strongly feel like I'm not going out canvassing, looking for people to change minds or hearts, because I feel like that's not where my my struggle is. So I I do think that there that is an activism and somebody needs to do that but i also feel like that's not for me i need to be forward thinking about what's going to happen with me and my people because betsy devos is still messing up education and you know civil rights are still getting the rollback and i feel like those are the places where i need to focus so i'm really interested to hear um, what do you think? What do, what do you think your activism is? Um, what do you guys think about um, where we fall and what we should be doing? Uh, um, I would I'm hesitant to define my own activism. Um, I when I was thinking, you know, preparing for this conversation. I wasn't thinking about it. Initially, I wasn't thinking about it on a very personal level other than when you say activism, the first thing I think about, similar to France, about Black people. I think about it in terms of justice and social justice 
for black people and women. Sometimes, the you know, the pro- yeah. not necessarily in that order, which order depends on the given day. Right. Um, but what I was thinking is that activism, I think, in general terms, is somewhat narrowly defined. It looks a certain way. You know, it, it is going outside of your house and doing something and spending your time, giving your time, your energy, maybe writing a check um, or two or some. Um, and to me, I feel about activism the way I feel. You know, we've had these conversations before about entrepreneurship and the people who insist that there's only really one way to live your life and it's in business for yourself and being your own boss. Mm -hmm. I think as with many other things, there are levels to this shit. I think that there are, and I think that everybody has a niche that they can get in, that they can fit in and not all activism fits all people. Um, I will say that where I have felt very low key impactful is on social media is um, using words. Um, I, I think that the first step towards making change is having the conversation about the change, whether that's within our own circles or with or, or outside our circles or both. Um, I also think that, you know, we cannot deny the impact of the conversations on social media because they have whole movements have sprung forth from social media conversations. And I will just say the obvious um, with black lives matter, which started off as a hashtag campaign. I think everybody knows that. Um, And the other thing too, the other reason why I feel like, and I know this isn't necessarily answering the question per se Malika, but I don't really, Well, I guess this will kind of answer it when I get to the end. Um, I think that the conversations are important and it's where I'm most involved because what we are fighting for, and I have said this before somewhere, what we're fighting for isn't necessarily tangible. We're not fighting for laws. We're not fighting for the right to live where we want to live or work where we're qualified to work or anything like that. Um, We are fighting for we're fighting to change people's minds, right? Um, and so in order to change people's minds about us, about our perception, um, about who we are and who we aren't, conversations have to happen. And sometimes with people and in spaces that you wouldn't normally have them. And to me, there's no better access for that to that than social media. So I guess if I had to answer your question, um, I would say that I am most vocal, most active online. Um, and I, my activism is my words. It's the things that I talk about. Sometimes it's the things that I post, although I've been slacking lately. Um, it's the conversations that I have with people. Now, I don't intend to rest on that. I simply haven't figured out where my place is outside of that it feels cheap to say this is what i do and really what it is is being behind a keyboard i do not consider myself a keyboard warrior social justice it's just what i do right now and i do feel like it means something in some regard okay well that answered several of follow-up questions um i think in terms of definition I think um I don't think activism is just one thing or can only just only done one way and I don't even necessarily believe it always involves going out to their community or to some kind of agency or on a march or whatever I do think um activism actually to me starts at home as if people have a family and I don't mean the family has to be somebody having children it could be you and your um, siblings in the house it could be you and your parents in the house it could be you and roommates you know whatever it is whoever your family is in your home Um, I think that 
sometimes that can be um, where the activism starts. You know, like as if, in being in a relationship with someone who has a child, I think part of, um, not the totality of it, but part of my activism is trying to instill in her a sense of herself as a girl and as a black girl. Um, and if I can at least lay some help to lay some kind of good foundation for that, that to me is a form of activism. It's 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 revolutionary to me to do that. So I do think activism can happen in the house. Um, but mm. I don't think it should end in the house, um, for sure. I mean, it should go past that door. And I also think people are pretty dismissive of activism via social media. I think it's unfair. Times have evolved. I can't even say they've exactly changed, mm-hmm. but they've certainly evolved. And so, whereas 30 years ago, we're walking around with flyers to talk about something, now we have text messages and email blasts and tweets and mm-hmm. Facebook invites and all of those things that we didn't have before. So I think we have a way to maybe make activism easier. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, AM, to talk about your week in fuckery a couple weeks ago when you were bothered mm-hmm. by the t-shirt about we are not our in- mm-hmm. ancestors and and the idea of people saying, well, you know, I'm not going to be holding hands and singing, we shall overcome. Mm-hmm. I might hit you with this brick. And that might happen. That is more likely true. to happen today, probably, than it would have been 30 true. or 40 years ago. But in, but in talking about that, I think when it comes to activism, especially in terms of mm-hmm. racial equality, um the 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 game is so mm-hmm. much different now. The playing field is different. See when it was Malcolm X or MLK or Julian Bond or whoever, there was a one more definite common issue and enemy, right? It's oh these Jim Crow Jim Crow laws are terrible. We got to stop this. And, you know, have some basic equality mm. and be treated with these. Now it's not that. Now it went from one like primary issue to hundreds of other things. So it turned in from went from that to a whole bunch of damn microaggressions that people mm-hmm. are now battling against. So I can't even say I'm not. I mean, we've all had it hard. Right. Every generation of black folks has had it hard in this country. Right. We just have had it differently, but it's all been hard. And now when it comes to activism, it's not as simple as I'm going to show up for the march or I'm going to walk to work or catch a ride with my friend and not ride this bus. It's not that simple anymore. I think it was what they went through wasn't easier. It just was easier to pinpoint and combat. What we have now is something that I don't even know exactly how, what the best form of activism mm-hmm. is at this point to combat the many different mm. levels of fuckery that we're faced with. I don't have just a bus company that I can boycott. I don't have, you know, a Woolworth counter that I can just walk up to with my friends and order a sandwich. It's not like that anymore. We gonna get in and get the sandwich, but there's a motherfucker in the back probably spitting in it. So I don't know at this point how um, I know what activism means to me, but I'm not sure at this point what's the most reasonable way for me to enact it on the level that I would prefer is because there are so many different mm-hmm. angles, so many different ways we're being pelted with shit as women as black people and i i just 
as the working class, all of those things that I don't really know how to address that. After I hit you in the head with the brick, now what am I going to do? What what am I really going to do in the way of activism? So I am often perplexed because I don't have the luxury to flit about the country going to every place mm. where there's some shit going down. I don't have the luxury of sending money, throwing money at every problem I see or everything that mm. outrages me or hurts me or you know, offends me or whatever. I don't, I don't have that option either. If I don't talk about it, I'll lose my mind. So I'm going to mm. have something to say about it. But when it comes to doing something outside of what I do in my house, um, it is difficult doing a thing that to me makes sense, a thing that I can do stand back and look at it and say, okay, I can see where this actually made some progress. So that's sometimes hard for volunteerism is different. It's easier. You go to Habitat for Humanity, you help build a house. At the end of the day, there is a house. You fuck around and go to a Black Lives Matter march afterwards, what's there? Fear (laughs) gas, rubber bullets, anger, hurt feelings like what? Somebody still in jail or dead, or falsely arrested, or raped, or, you know, what did I do when I came out with my sign and fussed? Or what did I do when I signed this petition? Um, There's a petition going around right now that is, you know, drop R. Kelly from your record Mm. label, whatever record label he's on, or whatever. And I do look at petitions. They are a part of activism. I do believe that. But I'm like, when it's a petition that's just hell a name. What does that mean? Like yeah. It has nothing to do with the law. Yeah. It's not something that's going to uh, go to Congress or to the Senate. It's not something that's going to start a bill process. I can do any of that shit. So if I'm just saying drop him and they're like, but he still sells this many albums. So fuck you. I, I don't know. Why am I signing this petition? So now... um. I guess the process for me is just trying to understand what makes it and what's going to make me walk away feeling like I actually did something today other than run my mouth. And I do think us running our mouths is important um, because some people don't even know a problem exists unless someone fusses rant about it. So I do believe we should always run our mouths. But after I'm done talking, I'm like, well, shit, I don't really know. I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do that's actually going to affect pain. I, I that, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I, no. I don't think I'm the only one. No, and I, I think that circles back around to what I was saying in the beginning, uh, or what I was introducing. And I want to be clear: I did use black as an example, but I think that that holds true for everyone. I think. It's Absolutely. not, you know, it, the, those same, the same ideas about it is not a queer person's job to make a straight person understand their plight. Like we, I do feel like just, you just be responsible for your knowledge. And I'm not arguing. I think, I think, remember when we were having that show about, um, coons and I was, I was asking if there's something that, um, people who don't agree with you ideologically can do to support the Mm. to push the movement forward or push the progress forward and i feel like maybe that's where i am where i'm like you know the places in life that are in a front like 45 is an affront to everyone who believes in the constitution believes in justice like let that wide swath of people fight him let you know the people who you know i don't agree with who are conservatives you know who only want you know us to have pray to Jesus in the school and not feed anybody or whatever, they still believe that kids should have school. So let them fight that. You know, I just feel like you have to find a place where you can see that end effort because you can't, it's very difficult, Malika, to your point to, you're not saying put the law in, you know, put a law in place. You're saying respect the law that is in place or don't, you know, sessions wind them back, you know, don't go backwards. But I agree with you. I think whether it's, you know, about, whatever kind of rights you're fighting for you know i don't i and i think truly 
how much talking is going to make a difference? Like, how long have indigenous people in this country been talking and look where they are still? You know, they've had strong advocates and activist systems. And what's really happening? Right. Right. I don't know. I mean, I agree, Franzi, that talking can't be the only thing. Um, But I feel like saying how much can talking do in some kind of way give short shrift to having the conversations and repeatedly having the conversations. I think talking can only Mm -hmm. do so much if you're talking to the same audience, if you're talking to the same people necessarily. But I think talking, I mean, listen, that's why people make a fat ass grip on lecture tours, right? They go to different audiences, Mm -hmm. they pack up their little message, put it in their suitcase and go around disseminating it to different audiences. So, I mean, I don't Mm -hmm. know if that's what, I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily what you meant or how you meant it, but it's how it, it's how it struck me. And I, I, you know, as a talker and somebody who likes words and really tries very hard to communicate a point clearly and succinctly in the hopes that people understand it, if not the first time, maybe after they go away and think about it, the talking is everything to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to downplay that for you and the people that you come into Mm -hmm. contact with, but I think what I'm saying is like the first day that I ever started with that I was a school teacher, this woman who really saved my life, Rash is what we called Mm -hmm. her. That was her last name. She called me into the room and she said, listen, I don't know where you're from and I don't know what you think, but what you need to get in your mind is that if you can have, you need to find one kid, one kid that you are going to see a difference in. And that's going to be your reward for this teaching thing. And I was like, one kid in each class. And she was like, girl, one kid every Ooh. year. And I was <laughs> like, holy Jesus, is that what we're doing? Because I'm going to see hundreds of kids this year. She said, and she, she put her hand on my shoulder. She looked me in my eye and she said, one kid per year. And you know what? I won't say that it wasn't a slight exaggeration, but she was not mm-hmm. lying. And to me, and that's why, that's a huge reason why I'm not a teacher right now, because there is a place, and I'm not saying you can only reach one kid. I'm not saying mm-hmm. that there's, you know, there are ways, but the truth of the matter is, you can, I felt great about being a teacher. I felt I worked so hard, mm-hmm. but you know what happened because I was a teacher? I felt great about it and I worked so hard and it wore me out. Like the kids that I taught, I'm not saying they didn't learn anything, but I'm saying I didn't change any lives. And maybe that was because I'm a terrible teacher. But what I'm really saying is the patterns start. I was teaching 10th graders, many of whom had already been in jail for a year or two. So the patterns had already been set. And that's all Mm -hmm. I'm saying, AM, is that. I, I don't downplay the importance of somebody being there. Like, it's like w- witnessing if you believe in whether you believe in Jesus or CrossFit. Like, <laughs> right. When you sit down and talk to that person, <laughs> you can change a life. Ooh. Right. You can one on one change a life. However, um, that is going to be a tiny drop in a huge ocean. And either you have to be happy to know that that's where you're, you know, you're doing that parable of the sower business where you just have to know that like 90 percent of what you do will you will not see mm-hmm. results from mm-hmm. or you ha- focus on something where you have a more tangible res- result. And I feel like mm-hmm. that's where I have to. And that's what and all I was saying is that that's where I have to be with the people like I will do all I can in allyship towards, you know, with group people, like the things that I expect from white people, I would do for every member that every group that I'm not Mm -hmm. a member of. Absolutely. But I have to focus my energy on places where I can see some kind of results. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I'm not saying that's for everybody. I'm just saying there have, there have to be people who do all those things. There has to be someone who's talking. I just know I can't be that person. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the, that's kind of what I was saying. Well, not kind of, that is what I was saying is, you know, I'm working on trying to figure out what and where that thing is because I don't like to walk away with mm. nothing. And like I said, the, 
conversations are necessary because I've had people say things about black activism or black social issues or that were or some that were maybe specific to black women and they woke my game up. I was like, oh, I didn't even think of that like that. Or I never heard of that. I did not know that was an issue because it's not my particular issue, right? So the conversations, I like when the conversations mostly are informational. Mm. I don't mind them being rants, but I like informational Mm. rants. So after you tell me why this is, or that this is stupid, that this is wrong, that this is an example of inequality or racism or misogyny or whatever, I want you to tell me about the thing and then tell me, is there anything I can do? Yeah. Or if there's not a, a, a place I can go, a thing I can join, is there a way I can change my damn mind so that I don't perpetuate whatever it is? I need that. I need at the end to feel like something actually happened. Even if that thing that happened was just me knowing better and doing better, that's better to me than walking away and feeling like, well, that kid is still dead. Mm. That woman's still Mm. dead. That man is still dead. I need more than that. I need more than, I don't know, I protested. I see there's an indictment that's inevitably going to lead to an acquittal. So I I need something. I'm still working on activating my activism, I think, I, like I said, I do something mm. where I can see a definite result, but I would like to do something on a, a little bit larger scale in my community, and I'm just not exactly sure what that thing is. I get invited to stuff mm-hmm. all the time. Join this, or you know, show up for this meeting, or you know, do that. And I'm like, okay, I see where you're going with this, but what exactly are you doing? Like, what will this do? I, it was Today I got an invite. It was like this young brother got um, shot by the police. It was a mess and they let him lay there for like half an hour, just shot in the face. Anyway, um, because they thought he was going to die. That's why they didn't bother calling anyone for him. But he didn't die. So now he's in jail. He's had multiple surgeries and whatever. So I think there's an arraignment coming up for him. And the invite was like, hey show up this young dude needs some support but i'm like all right well what if i do come to this then what what is that going to do i don't know what i can do for him just sitting in this chair looking while these court proceedings go on and someone inevitably tries to make him out to be the sole villain in all of this so i don't know what to do with that the only thing i could think that i could actually do for that dude is reach in my pocket and put some money on his legal defense fund right and i feel like that's the only tangible in this situation and that's what i keep coming up against are situations where i I just they would just make me feel helpless instead of making me feel helpful or they require me to dig in my purse and i can only go in there so many times and actually come out with some money (laughs) sometimes i reach in my purse and nothing comes out but like hair pins and maybe an old rubber finger that I accidentally brought and, home from work. And that's not going to help anybody. Sometimes I dig in my purse. And you know what I pull out? Not money. An <laughs> old shirt. You remember shirts? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the kind that came out of the wrapper and it has right. the dust okay, on it. Okay, that's how much there's yes. no money yes. in their shirt. I don't need them yes. to sell them shit anymore. Man, no, it they used to be not. the business. So my mom used to have some in her purse. They're delicious. Um, I hear you. Mm-hmm. I just, I know we're probably about to shut it down. I, I want to make two quick points. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, with regard to marching, I think that there is a release in that. Sometimes it's good to gather together with folks and just let fools know that you're angry and be angry and sad and upset with another group of people publicly, as long as that doesn't evolve into violence. But I think that that kind of activism is kind of almost internal, right? It's for us. And it's to let people know. It's, it's to me like a public form, like of anger and grieving. And you no, know, we're not just going to quietly be sad and upset and angry about this. You get to see how this impacts us, how painful this is. The other thing is sometimes 
a need is so strong, when a need is so strong, you're doing what you're doing. And you alluded to this or you said this, Malika, you're doing what you're doing, but it's not enough. I have had that experience, not about blackness, but remember when I used to volunteer at the library, Malika, for that one yeah. summer, um, I was I'm doing resumes, helping people do their resumes, um, just drop in. Um, and I did it for a while and I stopped because I was there for four hours on Saturday. Part of why I stopped. I was there for four hours, um, not even every Saturday. I can't remember if it was every Saturday, but in those four hours, I would inevitably get a person or two. We would work together and they would be like, okay, I want to come back and I, I want to do such and such. When are you here again? Uh, <laughs> next Saturday or Saturday after next. And they would be like, oh. And I would tell them, there's another, you know, there's another person that comes on Thursday. Please come in and work with them. And they would be like, no, we've already started this and I want to finish it with you. And these are people with varying degrees of need, right? Some of these people are like, you know, when you need a gig, you need a gig. You don't have a week and a half. You don't have two weeks to wait. And one could argue that, that it's not the time to be choosy, but I had that happen repeatedly and I felt bad. Like I don't have as much time as I need to have to be able to, to give to this. Um, and it started, mm -hmm. it also started feeling like a responsibility out, not, not something I was volunteering my time for, but a responsibility, like a gig, except I wasn't getting paid for. There was just this hole that felt bottomless. And I could see how, particularly in terms of activism, as it, as it relates to black folks, I can see how certain things definitely feel that way. I can see how teaching feels that way or can feel that way, particularly in certain cities and, and, and parts of the country. And then, yeah, what do you, I mean, I stopped. What, 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 what do you do? How do you make peace with that and keep going? But I think you've hit on something that's really important, and that is how many people are doing so many things, because you wouldn't have felt like that if you were part of like a consortium of people who said, every day we come, Monday through Friday, or even mm. Tuesday through Thursday, we come and we're here. So somebody will be here. Your shift is two hours, or, or maybe it's mm -hmm. all four hours. You're here for four hours, and then somebody's here mm. again tomorrow. And I think that's really where I kind of am, where it's like, I, there are some really specific needs. Like I really want to do something to address both like the, you know, nonviolent felon, you know, re-entry piece. Mm. Like I, I feel really strongly convicted about that. Like, I feel like there's something in the air there that I need to move towards. And also like a housing mm. um, advocacy kind of thing. And so it's like, okay, so I got to find people who are doing that. Cause I think to your point, when you are doing that alone or virtually alone, because Thursday and Saturday, yeah. that was, I mean, who knows what it took for those people to get to that library, right. you know, right. and maybe they walked for four miles and they're like, exactly. oh, I need a job tomorrow and I'm going to have mm -hmm. to walk downtown to get it anyway. You know, so yep. I, I do. I totally agree with that. And I think that we part of what the new the future is. And that's the way that I think social media can be helpful is helping people who want to do light things move that's also i should say a way that social media can be helpful is helping them move together yeah. you know and, and and helping them find people who are of like mind. Yeah. so you know it's interesting i didn't think we'd end up with so many sort of open-ended <laughs> <laughs> answers but i'm okay with that because i didn't do this so yeah. that we could solve the world's activism problems and 50 minutes or 60 minutes. We don't have to answer, Sway. <laughs> show don't. Show don't. But I tell you what, the minute I think I have some kind of piece of an answer, I'll definitely come back to Good. share it. So, we're going to get on with our shout out. Uh, I am going to go ahead and shout out Colin Kaepernick. Um, this is the miniest and that is now a word many at <laughs> time. I have <laughs> talked about him. Um, so Mike Vick and all his oh. dumbassery said that maybe if Colin got a haircut, he should get a haircut so that these white people would Man. give him a job. Yeah. So, because um, that's the problem. It's right. the haircut. Right. Lack lack of a haircut. 
And he was like, not even cornrows, though, because he's beyond that now. He should just get a haircut, said the man who came into the league with dusty okay. cornrows. But anyway, um, Cap responded, uh, I think it was Instagram. <laughs> um, he responded and to Twitter. that nonsense. Yep, and Twitter with um, just the definition of Stockholm Syndrome, which <laughs> was funny. That was so dope. That I loved seen. it. Um, and then Mike came back. Well, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with his hair. You know, I'm definitely not saying that he just needs a haircut. I'm like, dummy, that's exactly <laughs> what you said. It's too late, Mike. It's too late. So just prepare for your dragging. See if you can get some kind of salve for all the torn okay. skin because you're being, you're, yeah, people will drag you for a long mm-hmm. time for this. But really, the shout out is for Cap. I um, really admire and respect him sticking to his conviction. And that shit is difficult, especially when sticking to those convictions interferes mm-hmm. with your livelihood, mm-hmm. your lifestyle, your comfortability, the way people who once supposedly loved and supported you now think of you. It's not easy to be losing those things, even if you are gaining in conviction and integrity and intellectualism and all that shit. It still hurts to lose respect in your chosen Mm -hmm. field especially when it's something you know you can do and you know you're good at. People used to pay you millions of dollars to do that shit and now they don't want to talk to you just because you acknowledge some real life Mm. truth. And so that shit is hard. Yeah. And so I commend that man because he is sticking to it even when it Mm -hmm. hurts him. Um, I'm sure it hurts him to get up in the morning and know that he's not on Mm. a team that he's not going to hit the field, that he's not going to suit up and make it happen. It would, I mean, I'm not an athlete, but it would hurt me if, if I was an athlete and I couldn't do the thing I love or if somebody told me my fingers were on restriction and I couldn't okay. type anything, I couldn't talk any shit or I couldn't tell mm. any truth. That would hurt my feelings. And so I'm sure that it hurts him. But um, hey, I'm backing him. I mean, I'll put some money on his book. <laughs> so shout out to Cap because he is doing the hard shit that most mm-hmm. of us do not want to do, don't do, and won't do. That's so right. Much respect to him. And a quick little note to all these d- ashy dudes who are out here caping for R. Kelly and Bill Cosby and everybody else. So you can go online and fight with people that you don't even know, but you're going to still watch all these games. Okay. Right. I'm just making sure. <laughs> right. All right. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Point all taken. Right. Point made. Well, of course, those are also the same men that talk about women for still going to R. Kelly concerts. But when a woman comes over and they think that she's going to give up the nap dugout. Yes, I brought that back. <laughs> when they think she's going to give up the nap dugout, the first thing they do is go put on an R. Kelly album, but want to talk about her bad because she went to the concert you all said y'all nappy dugout. well the master key doesn't work if you don't have r kelly don't playing. you don't you get started. <laughs> maybe it's just a shitty lock uh, anyway um, um yeah shout out i'm gonna and- follow up on your shout out and shout out shannon sharp who shout out to <clears throat> shout shannon out to shannon sharp was out there telling them truths like he does, because this isn't the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically just called uh, Vic out for what we all knew he was doing. Um, it's a video mm-hmm. clip. We'll have it um, in the show notes. But, you know, <laughs> I'm going to admit that the shallow part of me really liked hearing all this blackness come out of Shannon Sharp's black ass face. Because that is mm. a Negro. He has very masculine black features, which I love. I'll eat him up with you. And looks good wearing that suit when he's speaking. Yes, he does. <laughs> yes, he does. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, there he does. is just some. Mm, let me not. I digress. He was telling them truth. He mm-hmm. was on point. 
We need people to watch it. If they haven't seen it, it was all, it was all in it through my feed uh, today, I believe. But I appreciate, especially another football player, um, yeah. another successful uh, former player, laying it all out and telling them truths and letting the people know. I appreciated that. Mm-hmm. And can I just like kind of co-sign with a little mini Chris Long, too, because now you guys know I don't know anything about football. But what I do know is he's not even necessarily a liberal, but he's definitely like, um, Everybody who's saying that this is something other than these stats that I just posted (laughs) about the top 16 quarterbacks is a lie. And I'm like, okay, Chris Long, I don't know you, but I could. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Brandon, do you have a shout out? Okay, so you guys know I messed up my shout out. Like I started it with all the blackity blackness and then I got caught up with the Luke Cage and I didn't even talk about the blackity blackness. So this is my shout out, which is really connected to the blackity blackness that I presented earlier. And that is about Eric on The Bachelorette. I know that I said all the things about him last week, and those things are true. I mean, he still did spell facade. <laughs> he I H-Y-S-D. Know. Oh, God. <laughs> he, oh, damn he, it. He did still do that. But, you guys, it was the uh, week that she went to see their families, hometown Home week. And his... Yes, his family is like the blackest family you've ever seen. The there is a um little clip of them like hey, oh, like gosh. they were whatever. That's it's amazing. Cute. I'm gonna attack. Oh, it's so good. And he was better this week, but I just loved it because they were like, I mean, listen, you already know you're coming to Baltimore. You know we do all the things. You know everybody in here has gone to jail, and we're just gonna have a conversation <laughs> with you, like it's all the way real. Yeah. And so that made me super happy, and I really loved like all of the very liberal outtakes on like the Bachelorette gets real in Baltimore. And I'm like, you know what was real? Them saying hey on TV, <laughs> you guys publishing it, putting it on TV. I just <laughs> love it. <laughs> so that's like my. Should have been high, but really is a shadow. So that's no all I got. Good. <laughs> well, we thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Tackling Tom Foolery. I'm Malika Rogers. I'm Franzi Moore. I'm A.M. Lewis. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Ta-ta for now. Did you say Tata for now? Tackling Tom Foolery is produced by Bryn Inman for Evergreen Talent Collective. For more information, find us on the web at www.tacklingtomfoolery.com, on Facebook at Tackling Tom Foolery, and on Twitter and Instagram. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, and make sure you rate and review the show as that helps people find us. If you'd like to contact the show, Email us at tacklingtomfoolery at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 916-573-1065. Let us know what tomfoolery you're tackling. Thank you for listening and we'll talk to you soon.